Good morning. Good morning. All right, so communion and baptism equals spiritual warfare. It really does. This is what we, this is how we demonstrate our spiritual warfare, our keeping our faith once we come to it. And uh, the fact is that decisions on whose side we're all on have to be made. In fact, they're crucial to living with personal inner peace and harmony and not that worldly nonsense of that. I'm talking true inner peace and true harmony with the Lord God. And that all his promises of God, woo, are in Christ and they're all yes and amen. Mm. Yes and so be it. Not maybe if, no, yes, no, whatever. Yes and amen, 2 Corinthians 1.20. All the promises in Christ, listen to this, in Christ are yes and amen that if anything was promised in Christ, and there was from beginning to end, they're all yes and amen. They're all for us. There's nothing maybe or nothing no. Think about that. No, There's no no. Ooh. So the Lord God is on the side of the true believer in him, the Father, and in his word, Jesus the Son, and their report the canonized 66 books we call the Bible. Now, it's been said that the Bible is a love story. And it certainly is that, but it's also a fight for survival. We have to get the perspective that we're being attacked daily. I have to repent daily because I fend off some of those attacks in an, in an unbiblical manner, to say the least, with my brain and with my words and I hate that, but that's what it is. But it's a love story from the perspective of the fact that God is love and, you know, he loves all his creation as a, as a, as a ballpark, as we find out in John three sixteen. But he's very succinct about those who don't want him and what happens to them by their own volition. So more than a love story, it's a fight for survival, eternal survival. We just sang about it too. Mm. It's a love story in the sense that the love part, which is the cross and the resurrection, is what freed us from demonic activity and captivity, which was leading us eventually to the lake of fire at the end of this life if we don't choose Jesus. A place where everyone is separated from God. I can't even imagine that. The world is separate from God, but they think they have, a, they have a, an equal partner that they can deal with that. No, they don't. It's all falling apart. And we know it, and even they know it deep down. So this real fight began in the garden, instigated by the Nahash, the shining serpent, who was a member of some description among the heavenly host of Hashem, or the Lord. And it's interesting that even apparently Adam as well had no clue that a real and most serious fight was just instigated by the devil. It didn't look like a fight. He didn't do this. He didn't do none of that. He just said, has God said? Yeah. <laughs> that was like cocking that rifle, right? Has God said? He drew the sword of trash, but they didn't see that it was drawn or that there even was one. But the fight was definitely instigated. They were about to engage in a fight against an enemy whose absolute cruelty they didn't even know existed. Satan is cruel to the max. Mm -hmm. I like a quote from Michael Heiser in the intro of his book, The Unseen Realm, in chapter 38. He says, Any veteran who has experienced combat will tell you that war is a terrible thing. Caught in such a conflict, you must take sides. Many modern people, particularly in developed countries, like to think that diplomacy and neutrality provide a more enlightened path. But some wars and some enemies don't offer that option. When an enemy wants nothing but your defeat and annihilation, neutrality means 
choosing death. I couldn't agree more. Mm -hmm. Scripture tells us that all who hate the Lord's wisdom love death. Proverbs 8, 36. Mm. All who hate me, the proverb says, wisdom is speaking, personified as a woman. Wisdom says, all who hate me love death. Think of that, right? And yours truly has pointed out years ago in our booklet, When to Turn the Other Cheek, because I was asked over and over again over the years, how can you be a martial artist and be a Christian? Very simple. <laughs> also, I wrote an article, uh, Martial Arts and the Christian, and there's a huge difference between being slapped on the cheek versus having someone wanting to cut your throat. We're talking cruelty. The former is done to get us to react with, you know, swinging back and, and all of that when that isn't really necessary for various reasons. While the other is an outright murderous attempt to destroy us and counter God, whose image we as believers represent. We have to do something about that one. And as much as we can, and God gives us the strength. So obviously on this earth, and in this life, the latter needs an appropriate response, listen to me, that is immediate, vicious, and final. When we train out there, you know, we have to hold things back because we can only train one time <laughs> if we don't. But the idea of vicious, of being like a banshee, of when that moment comes, God forbid it should, but if it does, you better be vicious or you ain't going to make it against the vicious. You understand what I'm saying? It's like one of David's guys said, oh, let me go and do Saul. I won't have to do it twice. <laughs> he was going to do it one time. That was it because his mind was made up. Bang, that's it. It's that kind of an attitude that I'm speaking about. And we do have enemies. Not all have faith, Paul tells us. So anything, you know, less in terms of true self-defense simply won't do. You have to be vicious yourself. And we all actually do know this. It's just sensible and right. Now, what is many times misunderstood or never grasped at all is the fact that this enemy of God and the enemy of his new human creation is out to utterly destroy humanity, you and me, from ever ending up as rulers of the earth and judges of angels. That's why. 1 Corinthians 6, 2, 3 tells us that that's the case. And this enemy of God and us takes no prisoners. And we can't either. It's a spiritual war. We don't negotiate a, a truce. There is no truce. He wins or you win. Christ Jesus won the victory. Do we believe it or not? If we believe it, we win. If we don't believe it, we lose, even though he won the victory. <laughs> Because <laughs> in the end, it's our faith. In whom do we trust, right? It's not about being nice or cordial. It's about righteously surviving to the end. Are you hearing me? So the way we believers carry out this bona fide warfare is by staying in faith to the true God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob while wearing our full personal armor of God. The helmet, the breastplate, the belt, the shoes, the shield, the sword, and praying ceaselessly. That's how we do it. That's being vicious in a godly manner. Are you hearing me? Yes. Should someone physically attack you, the viciousness becomes physical because it has to. You have a right to stop the threat. Now, we don't deviate to the right or to the left when we do this. There's no retreat. We march forward as the Lord gives us each our personal directions. Something else we teach, we call it forward pressure. It's always forward energy, forward pressure. Nothing different here. Now, here's something interesting you might not have thought of, but the idea behind the meaning of the phrase, gates of hell shall not prevail against it. That is the kingdom in Matthew 16, 18. Jesus is speaking this. It refers to the devil's kingdom's gates, which cannot stand to protect 
evil against the gospel of Jesus Christ. Mm. Gates are installed as a defensive measure in case of attack. And since the resurrection, the devil is in a defensive posture. We're celebrating that today especially. We celebrate it once a month anyway when we take communion in remembrance of all of that. There's death, burial, and resurrection. The resurrection is always part of that trinity of the death and burial. Okay? But he hides behind gates of deceit. Think about it that way. They're his gates and they're gates of deceit. I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. God's about done with the church. And the gates are getting bigger, aren't they? Satan's gates are getting much bigger because people want them to be bigger. They're helping him build it. But the church is coming together. And when all Gentiles come home, we're going home. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So since Jesus received back all authority of rule and power, Matthew 28, 18, Satan's kingdom was forced to erect gates in a manner of speaking. So collectively as a body of believers, we are to corporately and publicly show whose side we're on. That's what it's about. Whose report will you believe, right? To whom we have given our allegiance. Or to whom have we given our allegiance? <clears throat> Within the church, our Lord Jesus has instituted two sacraments, communion and water baptism. <laughs> Unlike the Roman Catholic Church, who lists seven sacraments, there are in fact only two that are biblically commanded to be performed by true saints. And God commanded these, not some denomination. That would be the important part. Both are acts of obedience to the Lord and both show the devils who are watching whose side we're each on. See, that's what this is. It's about ownership. It's about master and servant. People don't want to hear this, especially in the West and especially in America out of the West. The land of the free, right? We like to think that we own ourselves, that we are in control of our own destinies, but it's a pipe dream. When you really look at your life, especially if you've lived some life, like some of us over the age of 25, <laughs> but these two sacraments are reiterating to the enemy, listen to me, they are reiterating to the enemy that our Lord and Savior Jesus of Nazareth defeated Satan and all his powers of darkness, and that he's taken back all authority. Not only in Matthew 28, 18, where Jesus himself says about 1 Peter 3, 22, also tells us that Jesus has all authority. And people always wonder, well, what's up you know, with the devil if you got all authority? Because there's a part two. When Jesus gets back the nations, that'll happen after Armageddon. It's all planned out. See, the debt owed to God by us, which the devil dangled in front of humanity since the garden was fully paid for. Once and for all by Christ Jesus on the cross. He didn't cry out, tetelestai, it is finished, for nothing. Mm. He didn't just say it because he wanted to speak Greek. You see? Just before he gave up the ghost, he said it was finished. Remember, it's an accounting term. The debt has been paid. With God, everything has a definite plan and purpose. And then Christ's whew, triumphant resurrection proved that these evil forces couldn't keep him in the grave but not for the lack of trying. Neither could they free their evil comrades who are still locked up in Tartarus where the Lord ordered them to be locked up and be confined after their grievous sin described in Genesis 6, 1 through 4. 
And they will only exit that place as they're being transferred, most likely in the blinking of an eye as well, from that place to the lake of fire, according to Revelation 20, 14. All hell, all inhabitants of hell will be thrown into the lake of fire. Communion and the Lord's Supper, hear me, are strong bombardments against Satan and his minions by us, the saints, to show what the superiority of Christ Jesus and to commemorate his victory for us with his glorious resurrection. Now that's a far cry from what the world does with it. The visible worldwide church celebrates this event today, and well, they should. The thing is, they've allowed the devil access to their bunker buster bombs by marrying this holy and wonderful event with pagan ideas of fertility. And so the bunny rabbit has become the symbol instead of Christ Jesus alone. Think about it. I've seen at least two church marquees, billboards, whatever, talking about an Easter egg hunt and all this nonsense. Are you kidding me? Yeah. And they've gone even worse. They've gone from real eggs to plastic eggs. <laughs> It's a double fake, you know what I mean? It's, it's, it's crazy. <clears throat> Jesus Christ alone rose from the dead. Power on. <laughs> so therefore the world and her fake church are honoring the goddess of fertility, Ishtar, from where the term Easter is, of course, derived and Resurrection Day is the only correct term in English. Yes. Every day of every moment is a struggle in this fight. Sometimes we take mental or physical hits, such as we lose it with someone, or we suffer some sickness or disease, or we have some financial setbacks, family issues, and the like. However, woo! However, at the end of those days, at the end of those times, we stand. That's what we do. We stand. As Jesus commands us to do in the heat of every battle against our souls. Ephesians 6, 13 through 17. Stand therefore, wearing your armor. What? You coming against me? Fire them. You stand. Here's my shield. Here's my sword. I can't get hurt. Got my helmet on my head. Got my chest protected with the righteousness of God himself. The Bible says, be holy as God is holy. In this body, I can only do that through Jesus. <laughs> with this head, I can only do that through Jesus. In spite of me having my helmet, and because of it, simultaneously. <laughs> the salvation I have through him makes me possible to be in that position, or makes it possible for me to be in that position. Hallelujah. See, this to the devil, when a saint stands like that, with his shield ready, his sword swinging, all his armor on, it's a reiteration as to whom we belong to, Jesus Christ or Belial. Obviously, we never belong to the self, although that's what the lie is. And the fact that these two ordinances commanded by the Lord were commanded precisely because they are reiterating our victory in Christ. That's what Satan wants to erase out of your head. That's what he began to erase. He started rubbing it. This is Eve's head. Has God really said, oh, you won't die? That's what that was. It's part of what Paul meant when he wrote to Timothy, telling him to fight the good fight. What is a good fight? The good fight is the one that we already won. 
The bad fight will be the one you lose. <laughs> the good fight you win. Christ defeated our enemy. Hallelujah. So with water baptism, we're reiterating the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord and our own death, burial, and resurrection, simulated by being submerged under water. Remember, we died to what? Self. We died to our flesh. Yeah, it rears us its ugly head, like Paul says, it happened to him, but Christ gets us out of that one as well. So when we come back up, it signifies the newness of life that we've chosen for ourselves from the moment we said yes to the Holy Spirit's drawing us to the Lord. We were considered saved when we believe in our hearts and confess with our mouths the Lord Jesus, Romans 10, 9, and 10. We sing the song. That's why I like that song. Everywhere I go, people want to know. <laughs> it's a good song. So this is also what it means to call on the name of the Lord, Romans 10, 13. All who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. All who do this in truth and sincerity. That's the, the, the check mark here, in truth and sincerity. They are promised salvation. And of course, along with all this, confession comes abiding. Once you come, you better stay. And no greater victory dance can be imagined that counters the devil's trash than the symbolism of water baptism. I'm born again. Give me a towel. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what it is. Hallelujah. And just to be clear, going underwater isn't what saves anyone, but the confession that Jesus is their Lord, and that with a clear conscience in truth and sincerity. It's one way we kiss the Son. Psalm 2.12 says, Kiss the son lest he be angry. And because that's a fact, we obediently go through this, this ritual that tells the devil that he lost, yet again, concerning this particular soul, concerning your particular soul. Hallelujah. Realize that every time Satan can't stop a baptism, he and his cohorts are reminded of their utter failure in attempting to stop Jesus' resurrection. Yeah. Isn't that good? <clears throat> See, war did break out in heaven. The dragon and his angels fought against God's angels led by Michael. The devil lost. We just sang it with Walt Mills. I love that song because it's scripture and because I like his voice too, but it's, it's just awesome. <laughs> The devil's a liar and a loser. He was never going to win, and there's no hope for he and his cohorts. They have no salvation. They're done. It's over. Lake of fire. It was made for them, the Bible tells us. This place was manufactured, if you will, put together by God for them. All those who deny the Lord, who deny the truth, who want to live without him, they'll get their wish. And remember... What uh, Irenaeus had said, or Irenaeus, nothing created can be uncreated. We live forever, whether it's in heaven or whether it's in the lake of fire. I've chosen heaven. I know you have too. Right. And I hope you all choose heaven if you haven't already. See, Jesus led the way, being the first fruit of the resurrection. And that means being first that others will follow. And the others are every one of us who come to believe and stay believing. Jesus had just spent three days in Sheol, in the lowest parts of the place of the dead, where the fallen angels are kept in chains of darkness. Tartarus was their place. It has divisions. And they were very personally, he announced his victory over them. Mm. This was the war that broke out in heaven, about which we are informed in the book of Revelation of Jesus Christ, Revelation 12, 7. War broke out in heaven. This is what it was. I can't, I can't, uh, I couldn't stop him. I couldn't stop God from making the promise to Adam and Eve and me after the fall. All right, I'll, get every, I'll stop Moses because I know that that's the line. Why they couldn't do that. All right, all right. I'll stop it some other way. 
I'll screw up all the descendants. Ah, that didn't work. All right, I get Herod to whack all the babies two years young. You know, I'll, I'll do it that way. That didn't work. I know what I'll do. I know who the Christ is. I'll have him whacked. I'll have him crucified. Nee, 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 nee. Yeah. And God said, thank you. That's yeah. what I wanted. I love it how the Lord whips Satan with Satan's own hands and weapons. He's like boxing himself. Yeah. He's knocking himself stupid. It's unbelievable. <laughs> but Satan and company were thrown out of heaven after that heavenly conflict. The Bible says there was no place found for them anymore in heaven. That is to say his official heavenly headquarters were permanently closed from then on. Now, since the cross, this is important to know, there's no point of accusing the brethren any longer. We're told, quote, who shall bring a charge against God's elect? The answer is no one can. Why? Scripture says it is God who justifies. <laughs> who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us, unquote, Romans 8, 33, 34. Yeah. And as Heiser has said too, and I've agreed, I've heard it elsewhere too, Satan is a prosecutor without a case. <laughs> He's an accuser who attempts to accuse those already set free by the Lord's grace and their faith in his grace. Christ Jesus can lawfully make intercession for us because he is our high priest after the order of Melchizedek, an everlasting priesthood of the three official offices of prophet, priest, and king. Hallelujah. Mm. And as far as the true believer is concerned, when Satan brings an accusation, that accusation is brought up in vain. It isn't even considered. It can't go anywhere past baselessly making it. God already closed the case. He already closed the case about that person, that individual that Satan is trying to accuse God to. Because that person has chosen their true master, Christ Jesus. There is no case. There's no case against you as a believer. There's no case against me. It doesn't matter how much I sin as long as I don't want to, and as long as I ask for forgiveness and stay in faith. That's why we have 1 John 5, 9. Praise God. See, God, the highest judge that exists anywhere, justified moi. Mm. Did he justify you? Yeah. Well, yeah. Period. This is why Satan can't say anything. Yeah, about Walt Harvard, blah, 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 blah. Justified. Shut up. <laughs> Just like that. You got no case. I love it. See, the accusation no longer has purpose because Jesus paid that price in full. Yeah. And the Father, by accepting that payment, justifies. The sinner is acquitted of being one and automatically became a saint. When a sinner becomes a saint, it's like one coin, two sides, and the one side gets wiped out. Oh, yeah. Ow! <laughs> <laughs> Satan's days of accusations were over at the resurrection, folks. That's why this pagan Mickey Mouse nonsense of rabbits and eggs and all this other crap, I can't take it. I don't care how how sincere some believers are. They're just foolish. They need to get with it. Too many people accept it because they have too many friends who are real believers and so they don't want to, you know. I can't take it. The resurrection is Christ's symbol of of victory over eternal death, hell, and the grave. I mean, is that a small thing? Is that a party thing? Is that a let's go 
you know, egg hunting thing. You know what? Go hunt eggs every day of your life. I don't care. Color them, do whatever. But don't call it resurrection. Don't marry it with the resurrection. Get a tree. Put stuff on it. Have fun. Dance around it if you want. But don't call it the birth of Christ. It's ridiculous. And just because I'm on that vein, dress up, pass out candy, but don't do it on the devil's designated day. It's his day. And God says, fine, let him have it. Well, we don't call it Halloween. We call it hallelujah. (laughs) Then have it the day before, the day after, any other day, but not that day. That's how it gets married. It's exactly what all the, the, what the Roman Catholic Church did in perverting things. That's why it's a false church. See, the Lord's Supper or the biblical evangelical communion is the other commandment to celebrate Christ's victory over the devil. The Roman Catholic Church has turned this into a blasphemous cannibalistic ritual via the teaching of transubstantiation which argues that the actual real body and blood of Christ are consumed when the priest speaks the prescribed Roman Catholic doctrinal words over it. And this ability makes the priest mystical. See, that's why people are into it. This is why Benny Hinn wore the white suit and Catherine Kuhlman the white dress sitting on a stage or standing on a stage, it makes them, wow, they're, wow. And then when that person says, oh, yeah, I just talked to Jesus yesterday. I just commanded a couple of his angels, and they did what I wanted. And the audience thinks, wow. Not everybody in the audience. We were in that audience. We didn't think that, but a lot of them did. So this ability makes them mystical. And it continues to fool billions. The world erroneously thinks that Roman Catholicism represents Christianity. I don't care where you go, what movie, what book, everyone thinks that that represents Christianity. Now, biblically, the elements of bread and wine only represent the body and blood of Christ Jesus for a memorial. It couldn't be more clear. In contrast, in water baptism, it is our own bodies that are ceremonially died and get raised to new life. In communion, it is Christ's own body and blood that actually did die, and that we acknowledge was broken and spilled to pay for our sins. That's right. And that's what it is. This shows our confirmation of the real event, not some denominational nonsense. And we can't have the real thing anyway, because the cross was a one-time event. The Roman Catholic re-crucifies Christ every time they take communion. It's an absolute blasphemous sin. Jesus is presently in heaven at the right hand of the Father, serving as high priest of the Melchizedekian priesthood. And that's what we ought to symbolize it with bread since he's the bread of life and wine symbolizes the precious blood in which is the life spilled for our sins. It's what Jesus meant when he said that we must eat his flesh and drink his blood if we want eternal life, John 6, 44 through 58. Verse 47 explains what it means to eat his flesh and to drink his blood. Oh, let's go there. John, the Gospel of Johann, chapter 6. Give me an ow when you're there. Right. 44. Are you ready? Yes. So he says, Jesus is speaking, he says, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught by God. Therefore, everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. 
Not that anyone has sent the Father except he who is from God, or has seen the Father except he who is from God. He has seen the Father. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me has everlasting life. This is the explanation. Verse 47. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which comes down from heaven that one may eat of it and not die. Speaking of his, himself. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the body that I shall give his is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. The Jews therefore quarreled among themselves, saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? Well, it's like Nicodemus saying, how can a man go back in his mother's womb? You know, it's, it, this is not what he's talking about. He's talking about faith. Verse 47 explains that. 54, whoever, or uh, 53, and Jesus said to them, most assuredly I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. It's spiritual. He who believes in me abides in me is what that means. Verse 47 explains what it means. It's about faith in Christ. He's making a comparison of bread and his flesh and so forth because they got physical manna from heaven and they still died. They still didn't believe. They still rebelled against the Lord. That's what all that means. Are you hearing me? So these terms are used metaphorically for salvation coming down from heaven. He distinguishes his flesh from the manna, the bread, which was miraculously, or also came down miraculously from heaven to feed the Israelites in the desert. But it couldn't save. Because you could have faith in the flakes that came down. They couldn't save. All you could do was eat them. In verse 63, Jesus explains that flesh alone profits nothing. That same chapter. And that it is a spirit, capital S, that gives life. And of course, Scripture tells us in several places life is in the blood. It's also why the blood of animals was forbidden to be consumed. Acts 15, 28, and 29. That's still the case. He then said, my words are spirit and they are life. Again, one can't actually eat words. However... What one can do is believe their correct contextual meaning or not. That's what his explanation is, see? So this whole thing about faith in him as Savior and Lord, verse 68 explains, but there are some of you who do not believe. So verse 47 says that all this explanation he did about flesh and eating is about faith. And verse 64 also says it's about not believing or believing. That's how you explain that whole chapter. <clears throat> Communion is a most holy rite that is like a bomb going off in Satan's headquarters, wherever it is, and sends shockwaves throughout the whole evil kingdom. This is why when we have it, we have it regularly. We don't ever not want to have it. We do it last day of last Sunday of every month. Both communion and water baptism are bona fide victory laps as we, uh, we as believers can and are commanded to take. They confirm that Jesus Christ won the battle that raged and is about to fulfill the next part by reclaiming the physical nations of the earth to rule them with a rod of iron which we saints will help wield. You and I are going to have rods of iron. You better obey the Lord. <laughs> Yeah, Revelation 2, 26 and 27 tells us that we'll be given the morning star as a sign of our power. And with his death on his cross and the resurrection from the dead, Jesus won the war. Our job is to come to and maintain our trust in it. And then, of course, witness as God gives us opportunity. Amen.
Let's pray. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for coming. Thank you for living. Thank you for showing us the way. Thank you for willingly dying on a cross, even though you're completely sinless and innocent. Thank you for showing the devils in hell that they're lost. They've lost. They can't get out. They can't do anything. All power has been given to you at your resurrection. And when you ascended up to the throne, you're defending us with the power of the Melchizedekian priesthood. Hallelujah. And no accusation from Satan or anybody else can stand because the believer is already justified by the Most High God, the Father in heaven. Oh, Lord, thank you. Forgive us our sins, Lord. Be with Pastor Eric and be with uh, Alan and Lori and Thelma, Lord, and help them heal from the maladies they recently had. And all of us, Lord, thank you for Jepsy making it today. Continue to heal her, Lord. And Danny Miller. And all the rest of us, Lord, you only know what still awaits us. Keep us safe on the road, safe from stupid people, safe from evil people especially, and especially evil officials. Evil neighbors as well. Protect us, Lord. Cause us to think and speak the right words and take the right appropriate actions that would praise you and glorify you in every situation in our lives. We pray for Christine, safe a flight home when, whenever that happens. We thank you for Brian, Lord. He's leaving <coughs> uh, Brian Hill, that is. Keep him protected like you have been as he travels for his job's sake. Brian Pettigo, Lord, thank you for blessing him with a new apartment. And Danny's and Jill and mine visit to see him last Friday. We had a good time. Thank you for that, Lord. Continue to bless us because we need your blessing. Continue to put up with us because we need you to put up with our sad, sorry, and sad flesh. Our self always gets in the way. Forgive us, Lord. And I do pray that this is the year you, you snatch us out of here. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.